And so the idea of the Turing test is for someone posing question, can you actually differentiate or know that depending on the answers that you get, whether you're dealing with a computer or with a human being. David, it's always great to have a conversation with you. So thanks so much for stopping by. Well, thank you for inviting me again. So if you don't mind, I'd love to start with the topic of AI, very much in the news right now. Now, I think a little unknown fact about you is that you started or you at least you were working on AI in the 90s, is that right? That's right. I studied artificial intelligence uh, in the 90s at the Vrij Universiteit in, in Amsterdam, which at that time was a relatively unknown term. When if I said AI, people look a bit funny. Well, what is it about? And I tried to explain, well, it's a mixture of, of maths and, uh, and perhaps logic and psychology. But of course, nowadays, AI, you can't escape. You see it everywhere in the news, uh, in, in, in every sector, it's, it's playing mm. an important role. So what were the thoughts even back then? Was there always this idea that this would be a huge force for good in the world? Or were there even reservations back then that we didn't know whether AI would take on this own life of itself or whatever dangers there might be? I think uh, the AI, and you can say, when did AI actually start? I mean, different people have a different view on when AI started, but you could uh, trace the origins of AI to the Second World War hmm. when uh, the bright people in Bletchley Park tried Alan to... Sorry? Alan Turing? Alan Turing, absolutely. Alan mm -hmm. Turing, indeed, with a group of uh, very bright men and women tried to decipher the uh, uh, encrypted codes from, uh, from Nazi Germany mm. and effectively combined the wisdom of linguists, uh, mathematicians, uh, psychologists, and tried to find a way to, to crack codes. And so in, in one way, uh, AI was born, trying to figure out how can we use also computers. Computers were kind of born then at the, at the time to decipher very complicated problems and do that relatively quickly. Mm. Of course, there was enormous sense of urgency to do so at the time. Mm. Of course, the nature now is a bit different, what we're talking about now. Uh, but the idea of using computer power to solve problems very rapidly and also sometimes use human type thinking. So heuristics, yeah. rules of thumbs is, is definitely what is behind AI nowadays. Do you have a particular view on chat? GBT, how useful it's going to be, how it's going to be used? Well, I'm experimenting, experimenting with it myself. I mean, I'm playing with it, trying to understand. I'm very impressed. I mean, if you think about the speed with which you can get an answer mm. is incredible. And coming back to Alan Turing, there is something called the Turing test. Mm. The Turing test is about can a computer mimic human behavior and use that as a metric to decide whether a computer is as intelligent as a uh, human being. So how, how does the Turing test work? Uh, imagine you have a room, uh, or two rooms effectively. In one room is someone who's posing question. And in the other room is either a human being answering those questions or a computer. But you mm. don't know. And so the idea of the Turing test is for someone posing question, can you actually differentiate or know that depending on the answers that you get, whether you're dealing with a computer or with a human being. Now, with chat GPT, it's becoming very difficult. I mean, you know it's a computer because it's incredibly fast. No human being <laughs> will pose the answer. But the quality of answers, <clears throat> although in certain cases they're nonsensical, <clears throat> is incredible. So the language, especially the way it's been articulated, is incredibly impressive. The more media I've been reading recently, the more terrified I got of the idea that this AI could take on a life of itself. You know, the dawn of the robots could come and we should be very nervous. But um, speaking with some other AI experts more recently, it seems that it seems very much contained. Where do you sit in that spectrum of feeling that the, the dawn of AI is a, just a complete positive on, uh, on markets and on, on society to being something that we need to be nervous about? I think even amongst the AI experts, there are different views. Those are very concerned about it. I mean, there's mm. very recently about a thousand uh, experts wrote a letter in which they expressed concern about AI, including people like uh, Elon Musk and, mm -hmm. and, and professors. I do think that actually the whole development of ChatGPT and other AI technology begs the question, more fundamental questions about who we actually are as human beings. I mean, mm. if you can see how these technologies develop, uh, the, the difference between how we think as humans and how we understand machines to be, it is, I think, very difficult sometimes to really distinguish the intelligence of, of chat GPT or other systems. And can we call that intelligence, and especially in these deep learning systems? 
And I think there's more, really the philosophical question, who we are as human beings is, is really now at the forefront and it's being forced by this technology. Whether we should fear it or not, I don't know. I think it's definitely a reason to, to think and ask some very important uh, philosophical uh, and I would say also ethical questions about where these developments can go to. Some other experts I've been speaking to uh, uh, seem adamant about the fact that AI will be an enhancement to most people's jobs by 10 to 20%, let's say. And then there are others who fear that it's going to replace a huge amount of jobs. I mean, maybe with reference to, to FTSE Russell where you work, but how do you see it playing into the labor market, for example? To be precise is a very difficult uh, question uh, to answer. Mm. I think it's probably a bit of both. Uh, so where technology on one hand will uh, be complementary to what we're doing, so make, will make processes more efficient, will be faster, hopefully even reducing certain errors. And this is your general what I'm, what, what I'm talking about. Uh, but it's, it's probably also true that it will replace certain, certain type of jobs. Uh, as we've seen that automation has done so uh, over the, the last hundreds of years. So I, right. I think we, we need to see it also as, as what's the impact of automation on processes and how, we, how businesses uh, are organized. And how about as it relates to, to FTSE Russell? Are you already trying to incorporate AI into what you do? We have run an AI uh, impact assessment. So what we're mm -hmm. trying to do is where do we use AI? How do we use AI? We also try to understand also the AI regulation. So there's a bit of development there. Uh, mm. This year, the EU has come out, so the AI Act, the EU AI Act. There's other legislation that we're trying to understand the scope of and how that impacts our business. I would say... FTSE Russell itself, we're dealing with companies, right? So less about uh, individual personal data. Yeah. What is important in our world, of course, is that our data is accurate. So uh, although I love ChatGPT, we also know that it can generate nonsens nonsensical mm. answers. Our business is all about accuracy, uh, validation of data. So although we can kind of observe what, what is happening, it's not something that we use. Don't use ChatGPT to generate uh, indices. That needs to be run according to a very strict process. Uh, we can audit it. The uh, answers need to be 100% reliable. So much of your business is about creating these indices and deciding, or should I say, building um, uh, benchmarks to see which companies get into the index and which don't. Can you talk a bit about um, those kind of conversations that you're having now with companies, who you're talking to when it comes to designing these indices and what kind of criteria that, that people need to pass to sort of get into these indices? With it relates to AI or just in general? Or? Well, I was going to start with more in general and then talk about whether you could do an AI indices and what index and how that would look. Well, the criteria uh, that we that we use for, for companies are published right They're on our website. We call them the, the ground rules. And, and we, mm. we spoke about the analogy of the recipe book. Yes. And so in that sense... What it takes for a company to be included in index is typically things such as uh, maybe the market capitalization. If you think about index like the FTSE 100, mm -hmm. uh, there we are looking at the largest 100 companies based on the market capitalization. That's effectively the market price times the stock, that's mm -hmm. outstanding, of all the companies that have a premium listing on the London Stock Exchange. So those are the criteria. And then there's some other criteria, such as free float. But big picture, based on those criteria, companies are either in or out of, or out of the index. We do that for the FTSE 100, but we also do that for more than, I said last year, 1 million. We have now 1.4 million, roughly, indices that we have effectively recipe for. We were talking earlier when you talked about country classification. Can you talk a bit about that? So FTSE Russell has a so-called country classification framework. Mm. Uh, so every company gets assigned a nationality and that nationality gets associated with a particular market. Mm. Now, depending on what market a company falls into, it affects the index eligibility. For equities, we have four different markets. We have developed markets, uh, advanced emerging secondary emerging and frontier markets. Mm. Now, depending on in which of those four buckets you fall, you will uh, have a certain type of membership. Of course, uh, the membership impacts also the type of flow. So uh, if you are a frontier market, you have a certain amount of flow. If you're in a developed market, you have probably more followers. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea being of a lot of markets, they want to get promoted to the developed market status uh, because that is most likely leading to more flows into that particular market. Mm. Now, what is it that we're looking at? For us, we try to assess the accessibility for international investors to a particular market. Mm -hmm. So we try to understand what's the regulatory framework, 
how are, for example, minority shareholders treated in, in a particular market. We try to understand how the FX market works. Uh, is it a well-functioning FX market? Uh, how does the equity market itself work? And think about things like transaction costs. Are they reasonable? Mm -hmm. uh, are there no punitive tax costs involved? We also look at things like clearing, settlement, and we use a so-called quality of market matrix to assess and score mm -hmm. a particular market. And we do that by actually en engaging with stock exchanges. So we talk to stock exchanges, we talk to sometimes also ministries of finance yeah. or uh, treasury departments and say, these are the conditions that are conducive for international investors. So if you meet these type of criteria, you're more likely to get promoted mm -hmm. uh, to a market where you'll get more flow. So this is a lot of engagement with various stock exchanges across the world. And how about on a, um, on a topic, let's just say like ESG, and there's a company that would like to be considered an ESG stock. They feel that they meet the criteria. How would they go about sort of lobbying you or trying to persuade you that they deserve to be in it? And how do those conversations go? Well, it's an interesting choice of words. So it's not a matter of uh, deserving. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's either they meet the criteria or they don't. Okay. So we try to avoid exercising subjective uh, and discretionary mm. judgment. Uh, but rather, what we can do is explain to a company, these are all the criteria that they have to meet. For example... A, a certain percentage of their revenues need to come from green... From green, green revenues, revenues, for example. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And then there's also well, how are green revenues defined? What type of activity? So again, we have a document that explains that. Mm -hmm. And based on, indeed, the, the data coming from that company, they either meet uh, those criteria or, or not. What sometimes happens is companies come to us and ask, well, we think we met the criteria, but you know, what, what, what happened? Well, we're not in the index. And of course, we then try and explain mm. uh, where they're falling short. For uh, especially our FTSE for Good Index, it's is the longest yeah. running index that we have. It's more mm -hmm. than 20 years that we've been engaging with companies, trying to explain these are the type of things that are important to get a better score. And there uh, we have a criteria of having an ESG score of at least 3.3. The score goes between 0 and 5, but if you're above 3.3, they're in the index. If they're not, they're out, out of the index. Uh, but so companies are trying to understand wh what does it mean? How do I get to a higher score? And what are the factors that contribute to a higher score? What are the factors that will detract them from the scoring? I can't remember we talked about this last time, but um, I feel that from the period of about 2010 to 2020, there was a huge pickup in passive investing, um, driven a lot by, I think, um, you know, new indices that were coming to the market. How do you feel the world of passive investing is going? Do you think that the, the rise of passive investing will continue or it's now time for active investing to come back into, into the limelight? I think there will always be a market for both active and, and passive investing. It ultimately comes down what uh, what investors feel is good value for them. I would say definitely the growth in passive investment is also about cost. right? As passive funds, uh, ETFs uh, have become much, much cheaper over the years. So that's been one of the driving effects of the growth of, of the, the, the passive market. But, uh, you know, I know you've been an active manager yourself, so have yeah. I been. And I think there'll always be a market for, for active investors. But ultimately, it's the end consumer needs to decide what offers value for, for him or her uh, based on their own criteria, on their own risk appetite, and of course, on their own, uh, on their own budget. That is what they'll have to consider. David, just before we finish up, this has been a great conversation. Thank you so much. Just what are the kind of things that come into your mind as we look out into 2024, 2025? Any big thematics that investors should be thinking about considering when thinking about sort of portfolio construction? I think there's still continuational geopolitical risk. I don't think that's uh, that's uh, yeah. going away anytime soon. So that, I think that will probably be a big driver for a lot of uh, investors. Including the role that China's going to play in, in the world. Well, China's going to play. We're still dealing with uh, the tension in Russia and Ukraine. I don't think that's that's going away anytime soon, un unfortunately. So geopolitical risk is uh, we have elections in, in many regions across the, across the world. Mm -hmm. uh, US, of course, very important. Uh, so geopolitics is going to play a, a, a big role. Energy, of course, is still playing a role. Inflation, I think, is a big theme. Central bank policy, of course, we've, yeah. seen the, we've seen uh, higher, you know, higher rates. Uh, and, and, and with that come all kinds of questions around how do you construct a diversified portfolio, 60-40, yeah. uh, how does that work yeah. in, in, in this environment? How do we think about correlation between equities and, and fixed income? What is the liquidity premium that investors should get in this type of environment? So lots of challenges, I would say, over the next uh, 12 months. It certainly won't be boring. Well, if there's one thing about markets, it's that it's never boring. And neither are you, David. So thank you so much for your conversation. This was great. That was very kind. Thank you, Jamie. Much enjoyed it.